Welcome to this IPCOS webinar on alarm management. Um, my name is Edwin Wheatink. I'm the uh, process control business unit manager within IPCOS, responsible for the uh, process control services and, and products. I've been active in the um, process control field since 1992, so more than 24 years. And in, in the latter half of that uh, period, I've, I've observed how different companies take different approaches to alarm management. Um, some of those approaches are very successful, others are less successful. And in today's webinar, I just want to share with you what our observations are and how some companies have been able to successfully deliver on their alarm management uh, vision. I'll start with um, introducing IPCOS just very briefly. Um, for those of you that haven't worked with us before, and then we'll get straight into the topic of, uh, of alarm management. I'll discuss why alarm management is so important, um, but I'll only do this very briefly. Then uh, we'll review the typical project facing for an alarm management initiative, and, and as we'll see, there's no such thing as an alarm management project. It's, it's rather an, an ongoing discipline. The core of the webinar covers uh, why it is so difficult for many companies to deliver on their alarm management uh, vision, and why is it that many companies start off with lots of energy around this, but then a year down the road, the alarm management initiative has lost all the momentum, nothing is being done beyond the first very basic improvements. And then um, we'll review some successful delivery models that uh, companies have adopted to ensure that the uh, alarm management goals are achieved and, and continue to be met. Um, some logistics, all participants are muted. If you would like to ask questions, then please do so via your Q&A chat window in, in WebEx. And I'll address those questions at the end of this uh, webinar. And if we run out of time, I'll make sure to address your questions after the webinar via email or through phone follow-up. All right, um, as I said, a very brief introduction on IPCOS. Um, IPCOS is an independent services provider focusing on optimizing control room operation. Uh, we provide services to customers for any type of DCS, any type of alarm management software, any type of advanced process control software. Um, our key strength is that we combine our in-depth process knowledge and, and operational experience with uh, state-of-the-art process control. And um, our business is, is really a people business. The, the knowledge and experience of our staff is, is what brings the value to our customers. Um, what do we do? We do studies, uh, audits, um, process control and automation, um, feasibility studies, benefit, uh, benefit studies, uh, benchmarking studies. Um, we do base layer, so PID optimization, not just retuning but also restructuring. Um, we do alarm management, we do advanced process control, uh, both implementation and, and maintenance activities, and we do training. Um, in this webinar, we're going to focus on our alarm management uh, experience. So let's, uh, let's dive straight into this now. Um, alarm management, how to actually deliver. Um, let's very briefly look at uh, why you should do alarm management. Uh, the, main, the main reason why alarm management is important has to do with uh, the hectic of, of operating a plant. And this picture that you see here, that's a picture I, I quite often use uh, as an analogy to describe the, uh, the real environment that operators have to work in. In your ide ideal scenario, your plant is running steady, there's no disturbances, no variations, no alarms are sounding, things are looking really bright. So it's, it's like this straight road ahead with clear blue skies. Um, the reality is, is much different, as you will know, and the reality actually looks a lot more like this. Um, now there's a large amount of things happening in, in the process and in the control room, lots of variation in, in key process parameters due to changing feed qualities, due to changing ambient conditions, fouling, and also due to issues with instrumentation and equipment. And in addition to that, the attention of the operators 
is is required for tasks like reviewing work permits, uh, work in the field, coordinating these field tasks, action logs that they need to keep, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it can be quite hectic for an operator. So what does this have to do with with alarm management? Why should you reduce the number of alarms that that operators are getting? Well, there's there's lots of reasons why you should reduce the number of alarms. And, and many companies that are selling alarm management software will go into detail on the fact that there have been big incidents in the past at several facilities and that regulations followed from these incidents that prescribe that an operating company should, should manage the alarms. And in our discussion with customers, we, we typically don't go into that. We don't go into the regulation side of things. We, we simply say that it's, it's common sense to reduce the alarms. And if, if our customer does not feel the same way, if they don't feel that, that reducing the alarms is, is common sense, then we'll probably not continue the discussion on alarm management. Our, our basic principle when we, when we talk about alarm management is uh, an alarm must mean action. If, if you get alarms that are not actions, actioned, then those alarms are pretty much useless and they should probably not be there. Um, the problem with, with alarms that should not be there is that they distract the, uh, the operator. They become like, like noise to his ears. Um, and as a result, he won't hear them after a while. And, and let me give you some analogies that you might um, that you might uh, um, recognize. Um, for those of you who travel and have been to an airport like Schiphol Airport at Amsterdam, you will have noticed that at some of these airports, especially at Schiphol, the uh, the number of announcements that are made is is huge. At Schiphol, during the busy hours of the day, on average, an, annou an announcement is made every 30 seconds. And if you count the announcements in the different languages, uh, some announcements are, are made in four different languages, the number of announcements is just huge. Um, uh, you continuously hear, don't leave your luggage in attendance. Mr. So-and-so, please make your way to gate C26 because you're delaying the flight. Schiphol is a non-smoking airport. May we have your attention for a gate change, et cetera, et cetera. It goes on and on and on. And you know what? If you've been waiting at the airport for half an hour, you don't hear the announcements anymore. It's simply noise to your ears. So if you would announce, if, if they would announce a gate change to your flight, then chances are that, that you won't hear it. it. There's simply too many alarms, too many announcements. Um, another analogy. If you've been, ever been to big cities in, in a country like India, for instance, like Mumbai or Delhi, you'll know that it's a, it's a sport to sound the horn of your car. Everybody is constantly sounding the horn while, while driving. And what's the result? After a while, you don't even hear them anymore. So if someone is about to bump into you and the driver is sounding the horn, it's likely you won't pay attention. Again, simply too many alarms. So bottom line, if you want people to pay attention, then you should make sure to only convey the important messages, crisp and clear, without noise. And the, the exact same is, is true for alarms. If you want operators to pay attention and take action on an alarm, then you should make sure they only get meaningful alarms. Um, maybe one last anecdote. I've, I've personally worked as a, as a control engineer on a project. I was working in the control room and, and during the night shift I had the operator ask me to um, acknowledge the alarm that kept bugging him while he was going for a, for a coffee. And of course I refused to do that, but it tells you something about the meaningfulness of, of that alarm. As you all know, um, process upsets can, can happen suddenly for a, for a variety of reasons. And when an upset happens, alarms will be uh, generated. And the question now is, will the operator be able to salvage the situation and, and keep the plant running by taking the right action quickly, or will the plant be shut down? And of course, the, the cost of a, of a shutdown is huge, not just in, in terms of production losses, but also in potential equipment damage due to, for instance, uh, thermal shock. So you want your operator to be as efficient as possible in responding to the upset and, and taking the, the corrective actions. Well, the chances of the operator being able to do that are significantly increased if you make sure that he gets the right alarms. 
and only those alarms that matter and which point him in the direction of the actions to be taken. And that's, that says it all. That's why alarm management is so important. So let's assume, uh, let's assume your company uh, wants to reduce the number of alarms. How do you go about that? What are the goals you're aiming for and how do you achieve those goals? It, it starts with defining some metrics that you want to improve on. And there's metrics and, and standards that are accepted in the industry. And two of those are, are listed here. Um, the average alarm rate, that's the number of alarms that is generated in a, in a defined period, um, say for instance 10 minutes or a day per operator station. You want that number to be low uh, to make sure that the operators aren't flooded with alarms. And they can only pay uh, attention to a, a limited number of alarms in, in say a time period of 10 minutes. So what you look at is the average number of alarms in those 10 minutes to be below a target rate. And also the number of times that the alarm rate is actually higher than the target rate uh, should be low. And in the graph shown here, which you might recognize because it's often used in the context of uh, alarm management discussions, you see that a, a high average alarm rate means that the operators are overloaded with alarms and typically they don't pay attention to most of them. And as you reduce the number of alarms per 10 minutes, for instance, the operators tend to pay more attention to the alarms and you get into a much more robust alarm situation. Another metric that is uh, important and, and very often used is the peak alarm rate. If there is an upset of some sort, um, how many alarms do operators get within a period of 10 minutes? If that number is very high, then it typically leads to operators being flooded with alarms and not knowing where to focus their attention. And this is the situation that we talked about earlier, where you can make the difference between shutting down or, or keeping uh, the plant running. Now, these two metrics are very often used, uh, but there's quite a few more that can be, uh, can be looked at. And examples include the average number of standing alarms, distribution of alarms by priority, so, so how many higher priority alarms does the operate, operator get compared to how many lower priority alarms, how many chattering alarms are there, you know these, these alarms that pop up every couple of minutes and get enunciated without paying any attention whatsoever. Um, and the, the target values for these type of metrics um, aren't general. And so you can't say, well, you should be below this number. Um, the, the target values for these metrics will typically differ per customer or per site or even per control room. And the reason for that is that the, the target alarm rates need to be seen in the context of operator skills, eh, what's the op experience of the workforce, uh, operator scope, how many different units is the operator looking at? Um, how complex are these units? And, and those type of things. But it's safe to say that the, the target numbers uh, for these metrics should be low for all the reasons that, uh, that we mentioned uh, before. So um, the first thing that you have to ask yourself when you want to do an alarm management uh, initiative is where am I? And what, what's my current situation? What is the alarm situation at my site at this moment? And that's, that's certainly a very interesting question and you'll be surprised how many customers are actually shocked when we do a quick benchmarking study for them and show them the results. And that's because staff that is being tasked with uh, alarm management within the customer organization uh, quite often does not get to spend a lot of time in the control room so they don't know how many alarms are active at any point in time. Um, so we often do this benchmarking study uh, at, a, at a low cost just to create some awareness with the customers and, and when we present the results there's often a uh-oh experience uh, with, the, with the customer. From this uh, benchmarking activity it it often becomes painfully clear that there's a need to do something, uh, especially if you compare the results to industry standards uh, from ISA or EMUA, etc. Now, once you know where you stand, the next question is, where do you want to go to? What are the metrics you need to work with? What are your targets for these metrics? 
and and this is where it becomes more difficult for customers to make good progress and, and drive the project with uh, with good momentum where you want to go is a it's a really important question that, that needs to be answered. Um, and it is addressed, it can be addressed in a so-called alarm philosophy document. Now this document basically defines how you, as an operating organization, want to do alarms right. Um, it defines specifically for your organization the whole alarm context, uh, including things like in your organization, what does an alarm mean? What exactly is an alarm? What alarm priorities do you define? What are the principles of alarm design that you want to adhere to? And that's important because you need to be consistent in how you define alarms and how you implement them. Um, what type of documentation do you want to have for your alarms? And is there any specific training requirements in the context of your alarm system? Um, who in your organization is involved with the alarm system? And what is the responsibility of everybody involved? How do you manage the, the changes that you're going to, uh, to make to the alarm system? Uh, what's your MOC context? Um, and, and how are you going to, to structure and update your alarm database in which you keep all your alarms, including their settings, the, the causes of deviation, the consequence of, of deviation, uh, required corrective actions, time to respond, etc., etc. Now. All these type of things are covered in the alarm philosophy uh, document and, and there's more. And it's, it's important to, to generate this document and get everybody involved uh, fully aligned on what you want to do and how you're going to work with your alarm system. Now, this sounds like a huge task. Uh, many of our customers believe that, that coming up with an alarm philosophy document is something that requires a huge amount of work. And, and the reality is, it does to some extent, um, but, but you don't have to start from scratch. Uh, when we work with our customers, we start from some, some excellent templates that will guide us uh, together through the discussions that need to be had with the disciplines involved. Um, and typically, as much as 90% of the alarm philosophy document can be used from what we call the best practice template. Um, it, it's much more about getting the organization to align on this and, and subscribe to the philosophy um, than about creating the philosophy. And this, getting this alignment um, across the organization really requires the, the process engineers, the operations department, the DCS team, the instrumentation staff, etc., all to be actively involved in, in developing the alarm philosophy document. And in our experience, uh, based on our experience from, from working in the control room during our control projects, um, we can help there because we speak the language of the operators, we speak the language of the, of the process engineers, the DCS people, we have DCS knowledge. So we can help bridge the gap between these disciplines and, and guide the discussions based on our templates that, uh, and that those discussions form the basis for your specific alarm philosophy uh, document. So, Summarizing, the alarm philosophy document defines how you, as an organization, are going to deal with, uh, with alarms. And why is this important? Um, this is important because your alarm philosophy document will be your guide or, or your yardstick, if you want, in the future. And it can be adopted on the go, um, so it, it can be a dynamic document, but the core of the philosophy should remain a stable guideline. Uh, on, on how you deal with your alarm system. Now, in your alarm philosophy document, one of the things you've done is you've defined your metrics and, and your targets. Um, your organization is now aligned on, on how to work with the alarm system, and now it's time to actually go and do it. Um, and the first step that is typically taken is, is a relatively easy one. It's typically referred to as bad actor resolution. Um, we look at the, uh, the top 10 or top 20 alarms, uh, identify why these alarms are occurring so often, and that can be a range of reasons, uh, incorrect settings of the alarm limits, uh, poor tuning of a related PID controller, noise on the measurements, those type of things. So based on the findings, we then propose a solution for each of these uh, top 10 or 20 alarms, and we follow the procedures that were defined in the alarm philosophy document to, to implement the, the solutions. And 
doing this will result in a, a big improvement of the alarm rate already because you've just taken away your top 10 or top 20 most frequent alarms. And when you're done with these, of course, you can turn to the next top 10 or top 20. Um, now, this is, this is typically referred to as the low-hanging fruit of the alarm management project. It's, it's quick wins, uh, visible results, but you'll notice that after a few iterations, um, there's no obvious top 10 or top 20 anymore. It's, it, it starts looking more like a, a top 100. And also, you need to remember that this improvement helps reducing the number of alarms that an operator is getting but it isn't necessarily reducing the peak alarm rate in case of upsets. And, and remember, eh, those upsets, those peak alarms, that's where a lot of value is to be gained by making sure that the operator takes the correct action based on the alarms during an upset. And this is where it starts getting more difficult for customers. Uh, here they start struggling with the delivery and, and getting the improvements from the, uh, from the alarm management uh, project. Um, so far, eh, in, the, in the first phase, the um, uh, bad actor resolution, all the action was directed at reducing the number of alarms. And, and that's important because uh, the operator will start paying more attention to the alarms if he gets less alarms per time period. Um, but then the next step is to, to look at reducing the peak alarm rate, the number of alarms uh, an operator gets if there's a, a process upset. And these alarm peaks are typically called alarm floods. That's not only about reducing the number of alarms, it's also about making sure that the alarms are all of high quality. They really, um, uh, they really mean something. And, and this phase is typically referred to as alarm rationalization. Uh, alarm rationalization is about going into the detail on alarms that occur during an alarm flood and asking yourself the question whether each of these alarms should be there and if not uh, how they should be changed. This is, um, this is about analyzing the root cause of alarms. Uh, understanding the root cause of an alarm is essential to being able to propose an effective, safe and reliable alarm solution. Um, and, and let me let me give you an example. A good example that everybody will recognize is a is a pump trip. You've got a distillate flow out of the overhead condenser drum of a of a distillation column, and suddenly the pump in the distillate line uh, trips. Now, this will of course generate an alarm from the from the pump. Um, but typically, the, the operator then immediately gets dozens of additional alarms, uh, a flow rate alarm. First the flow is low, then the flow is low, low. The pump trip might cause a, a blip in the reflux flow, so the operator will get a flow rate alarm on the reflux flow. It might as well cause a pressure or, or delta pressure alarm, or both, in the overhead system of the, of the column. Um, and, and after a while, it will generate a level alarm in the overhead accumulator. So there's maybe dozens of alarms that are generated, and probably a lot of them with high priority. But the question, of course, is whether all these alarms need to be raised, because if the operator knows that the pump has tripped, he will know that the distillate flow is zero, and that the reflux flow will show a quick blip, and that the level in the accumulator is, is going, going to go up. So instead of raising all these alarms, let the operator focus on the root cause, uh, let him take corrective action uh, that addresses that root cause, without being distracted by alarms for things that he already knows. Um, so in order to, to do this type of alarm rationalization, you really need to carefully look at what alarm should be raised when. And a, a part of this could involve dynamic alarm suppression, eh? suppressing an alarm in the DCS in certain cases, because the alarm is what is typically referred to as a, as a consequential alarm. It's simply generated because of, uh, of something else that has already been alarmed. And for you to be able to, to do this, what's required for this is, is really process knowledge, eh? understanding what is happening during the upset and, and what the consequences are. Operations knowledge, again, understanding what's happening and, and what the operator should be doing. And also understanding how things are being presented to the operator. 
Um, DCS knowledge, if an alarm should be conditional, then how do you implement this in the, in the DCS? So like with the alarm philosophy document, this phase of alarm management is about bringing different disciplines together and, and working to define the right alarm configuration and, uh, and, and setting. Now, unlike with the bad actor resolution, uh, where you can simply focus on the top 10 or top 20 alarms, it's less obvious where to start with alarm rationalization. But, but a good way of, of choosing the area to focus on is by going back in your alarm history and, and looking at situations of alarm flood. Identifying those situations and then prioritizing them will help you define where to, uh, where to focus first. So that defines where to focus first. Another question is where do you stop? And when, when are you done with alarm management uh, and, and your alarm rationalization? Well, remember that you set yourself some targets in the alarm philosophy document, right? So uh, you define your targets, uh, your target average alarm rates, your, your target peak alarm rates. And if you keep monitoring these metrics, then you'll know whether you've achieved what you wanted to achieve. And once you're there, you might as well set yourself some sharper targets uh, once, you've, once you've reached your... Uh, your original goals. Now let's assume you've not only done the bad actor resolution, you've also done a significant alarm rationalization effort, you've reached your targets that you defined in the alarm philosophy document, are you done? Well, the, the real answer is no. Uh, uh, once off is not enough, we always say. If you, if you don't keep paying attention, you'll see that slowly over time uh, the alarm rates will start to increase again. And the, that is typically due to small changes in, in operational modes, uh, equipment changes, instrumentation changes, etc., etc. So it's only logical that alarm rates will start to increase again slowly over time. So you need to stay on top of things. And the best way to do that is to regularly report on the metrics you defined. Uh, clearly list the targets that you achieved already after the alarm management uh, project, the initial uh, phases. Clearly show the actuals, uh, preferably in a trend over time, so, so that makes it very visible that there's uh, what we call alarm creep. And then based on that, you can take action in, in the exact same way as you did, did uh, during the project. Okay, so we've laid out the path. Uh, we've covered the project phases that you would typically need to go through to, to reach your goals, to, to get to your, uh, your targets. Um, and, and to be honest, I, I don't think that sounded too complicated, did it? I mean, uh, the, the phases are pretty clear. Um, I think at least everybody, um, everybody will, will recognize a lot of, uh, of what we discussed. So uh, why is it then that, that so many companies are finding it difficult to deliver? Uh, and, and why is it that this alarm management initiative um, typically does not make it beyond the low-hanging fruit phase, if, if customers get through that at all, even. Well, there's a couple of aspects that are causing this to happen in our experience, and what I'm going to say is based on, on observations from, from working with our customers. The first thing that I would say is um, unrealistic expectations. There's there's quite a few software packages available in the industry that address alarm management, and, and some are really good, and some are not so good. And one of the packages that we often see that you will all be very familiar with is developed by Microsoft. It's called Excel. Um, but there's also a few uh, software packages out there that are more tailored towards alarm management in the process industry, fortunately. Now, some customers invest in alarm management software with an expectation that installing the software will magically reduce their alarms without the customer staff having to spend too much effort. Um, and after everything that, uh, that I discussed on the, on the previous slides, it, it sounds strange really that one would expect um, that it doesn't take uh, um, any effort from, from people. But trust me, there's plenty of managers out there that have this expectation that the software will solve all their problems. Um, now, 
most of you will know that that is not true, right? The, the alarm management software will help you structure your work. It will collect information, structure it, report on your metrics, uh, allow you to document changes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So these tools are a very good way of structuring your work and making it easy for you to work with the alarm and event data. But it won't do the alarm management for you. You still need to go through the process that, that we discussed before. Now, if your management did not realize that it is necessary to do the work we discussed, then your team won't get the time allocated to do the alarm management work. And, and that's the second reason why so many companies are struggling to deliver on the alarm management goals. Uh, all resources are busy these days. There's no time to spare. Uh, and alarm management is an activity that requires focus on of several disciplines. So it can't be done between, say, your second and third coffee in the morning. Now, the two reasons that, that, that I listed here, uh, the wrong expectations, the limited time, uh, are probably very obvious, uh, but the most important reasons, uh, reason that we observe why customers are having difficulties in, in delivering real results with alarm management projects is that the experience um, that is required to drive the project is, is not available. As I said before, alarm management touches on a couple of key disciplines in the operations space, uh, process operations, process engineering, uh, DCS team, the instrumentation department, the control department maybe even. And, and to really drive the project, it's imperative that, that someone owns the project who is at least somewhat familiar with each of these disciplines. And what we see is that often the alarm management project is owned by, for instance, a, a process engineer, and the process engineer being very experienced with the process, detailed understanding of the, of the, works of, the workings of the, of the process, the equipment, etc. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the process engineer is, is quite familiar with the operation in the control room, the ergonomics of the operator station, the way the alarms are being presented to the operator, and, and Typically, especially he lacks the knowledge on, on how an alarm is configured in the DCS, how it can be changed or dynamically suppressed, etc., etc. And if, if that is the case, then proposing a solution for changing a specific alarm is, is very challenging for, for this resource because he doesn't know that how the change is going to impact the operator. He doesn't know how, whether the proposed change is even feasible in the DCS. So um, the result of that is that a meeting is held between the different departments, process engineer, operations superintendent, DCS engineer, instrumentation guy, and, and the proposed solution is, is fairly vague, it's fairly open. And, and basically the meeting is going to define the solution. And that's a very inefficient way of, of dealing with the alarm. It, it would be a lot more efficient if a solution would be proposed based on knowledge of all disciplines, and then a meeting would be called to review and agree the proposed solution and push it into the MOC procedures. And that way, the meeting becomes a review meeting instead of a meeting in which a solution is being created. Um, in order to be, to be able to do this, huh, you, you need a person in your organization who's familiar with the process operation, the process engineering side, the DCS, etc., etc. And my bet is that if you have that person in your organization, I can guarantee you that that person is already busy 150% of his or her time. So how do you address these, uh, these factors that make it difficult to, to deliver on your uh, alarm management project? Well, uh, of course, it starts with, with managing the expectations of everybody involved. It has to be clear to everybody involved, including management, what is required to make this a success. It has to be clear to to everybody, especially that this is not just a software and, and data project. Yeah. Um, and typically we can help there with, uh, by, by setting the expectations right as part of the uh, benchmarking activity. Uh, when, we, when we come and present the results of the benchmarking study, we typically indicate what the logic next steps are, where you could work towards as, a, as an organization, and, and what it takes to deliver on that. And, by clarifying this early in the project cycle, huh, so after the benchmarking study, you ensure that there is no unrealistic expectations that will lead to, to disappointment or, or even frustration. And then how can you get some more momentum in the alarm management project? Well, basically by, 
by <laughs> debottlenecking your project. Um, if, if you look, for instance, at the workflow for uh, an alarm rationalization effort on, on one or a few alarms, um, then really you need to minimize the time that the different disciplines are having to spend on this alarm management project. Uh, at, the, at the highest level, um, the steps you will go through for, for each set of alarms are first a detailed analysis for the root cause of the alarm, as we discussed, then the design of the solution for the alarms, and, and this can range from simply setting the alarm limit to a different value, uh, removing the alarm altogether, all the way to dynamic and conditional uh, suppression of the alarm, and, and then reviewing and approving the proposed solution. And if you don't have someone creating the design with, with the required cost discipline, cost discipline knowledge, as I said, um, you'll end up recreating the design in the review meeting, which is going to take a lot of time from everybody involved. Um, and, and the most costly time in the alarm management project is exactly that time that is spent in this meeting where, with all the disciplines involved. And as I said before, the, the purpose of these meetings should be to review and agree a solution and not to create one. Now, the creation of the draft solution can be done beforehand, provided that is done by someone who's familiar with all the disciplines involved. Now, if you have someone in the organization who can do this, then allow that person the time to do it. But it's also very feasible to, to outsource this as uh, to a party that can bridge the gap between the disciplines. And of course, I wouldn't be presenting this webinar if, if IPCOS would not have the resources who could do this. Um, and based on our experience um, that we have built up by, by doing um, projects in the control room, we are intimately involved with the process operations side, the process engineering side, and the DCS and instrumentation teams. Uh, in, in our control projects, for instance, we have always had to work together with all these disciplines, so we speak the language of each of these departments. And since we're technology independent, we have experience with all the major DCSs and, and with different software packages. But that's the sales side of things. Uh, let me get back to the um, to, to how to debottleneck the project. So if you don't have anyone who can who can drive the project from inside, um, it's perfectly feasible to, to outsource it. And that doesn't mean that you don't have to be involved anymore. Of course, uh, you have to be involved. Now, how would that work then? Um, Let's assume you are yet to start your alarm management effort, so let's get back to the start of the alarm management project, the benchmarking study. Uh, um, you could outsource that benchmarking study. We could do that for you. Um, if you have your alarm and event history available for us, then this could be done very quickly and efficiently. Um, otherwise, there's some data collection to be done first, but that can be done automatically, of course, so no big deal. Um, then based on the benchmarking study, uh, together, we would not only show you where you are with respect to the average alarm rates, uh, your alarm floods, your fleeting alarms, chattering alarms, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, we would also use that information to propose next steps: huh? what to do, where, for which alarms, etc. And, and in parallel, if if desired, um, we can start working on an alarm philosophy document specifically for your organization. And, and as I said before, that doesn't need to be created from scratch. Eh? We would take one of the templates that best fits your organization, adapt it based on our knowledge of your specific situation, and then have your organization review it. It will typically take several iterations to get it right and, and complete, but the involvement from your organization is, is focused on reviewing and modifying and not on creating. And that makes it a lot more efficient. Um, then, based on the conclusions and recommendations from the from the benchmarking study, you can you can have us address the alarms that were listed as the as the first to action, and um, for the rationalization activities, the alarm rationalization uh, part, the workflow look would uh, would look as follows. And what we would do is analyze the alarms, uh, propose solutions for these alarms, including the way to to implement these. And again, then have that reviewed by your organization in a, in a focused meeting with all the disciplines involved. And, and once agreed, the solution can then be implemented. And, and again, these, the, the meetings would be focused on reviewing and agreeing, not on creating the solutions. And, and just to make sure that the meetings are as efficient as possible, uh, because 
these meetings are, are very expensive. With all your key staff from different disciplines sitting in the room, you want these meetings to be as efficient as, uh, as possible. Um, the frequency at which this would be done would very much depend on the customer organization. Uh, sometimes uh, the customer prefers a site resident engineer to drive the project, but we would advocate a model um, in which our engineers are at site on, a, on an on and off basis. Um, some of the preparation work can be done in our offices and our site presence would be um, focused on, on the review meetings and analysis of alarm flood situations with the operators, uh, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So in our experience, customers typically appreciate the on-off schedule because it gives them um, periods in which the demand for their time is lower whilst our team is, is working in our office preparing solutions for the next alarms uh, to, to be addressed. In other words, you get a break. Um, and although that might feel like a delay in the project, um, I can guarantee you that this way the enthusiasm and, and the motivation for the project is typically higher for a longer period of time than uh, when it's done continuously at site with, with continuous demand uh, for your time. As you work through the project, um, there's going to be a point in time where the, the frequency of the, of the site visits and the, and the review meetings can start to drop, uh, simply because a lot of the work has been done and you're getting closer to your targets for, for the metrics that, uh, that were agreed. Um, and then there's an opportunity to, to take things more in your own hands and, and drive the process yourself. Now, that will be easier than before. Um, because as a result of the work that was done, you will have staff that is now much more aware of the, of the cross-discipline actions um, and the cross-discipline aspects of, of the alarm management. And also, you will realize that there's more and more templating available. As you do more and more alarms, uh, you will discover that there's quite a few similarities between different alarm scenarios, so you can start using previously agreed solutions as a sort of a, a template for, for your next alarm. Um, and of course, that, that increases um, efficiency yet again. Um, we do recommend, typically, that you have your alarm system audited every, every once in a while. As I said before, you need to stay on top of things so to prevent uh, alarm creep. Now, you can do that yourself, especially if you have alarm management software installed. Uh, but many of our customers prefer, prefer to outsource that quick audit because it's as part of the audit, an analysis and recommendation can be made on, on what actions to take to, uh, to stay on target or, or get back on target. Um, and of course, that's something you could do uh, yourself as well. But it's all about what is the best use of your time, of course. One advantage that we bring to the table in, in our alarm management consultancy offering is that we can also relate alarm management to, to PID tuning. Uh, too often we see that uh, alarms are generated due to process deviations that are purely caused by bad base layer control of the plant. So in our alarm management activities, we can identify bad control as the root cause for some of the alarms. And, and if required, we can immediately address that given uh, our process control uh, experience. So. That brings me to the uh, the value we add to your to your projects. And we can tailor the project to your needs and your organizational capa uh, capacities. And we can we can benchmark your alarm situation, define the priorities, help you define the next steps based on your specific uh, situation. And this could have to do with resource constraints, resource skills, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, we can drive the project for you, making sure that your time is only spent on um, review, approval, and implementation, and making your time spent as, as efficiently as possible. Um, probably the biggest, uh, the biggest help to, to our customers is the fact that we can bridge the gap between the different disciplines involved, uh, based on, on our experience working in the control room for, for many years with, with many different customers, processes, DCSs, software. Um, and and all together, I think the key uh, the key takeaway is that um, we we look at alarm management as something that requires knowledge, requires uh, process knowledge, DCS knowledge at, at 
etc. Um, alarm management is not something that is purely data driven. Of course you need data to do your analysis, um, but you can only do proper alarm management if you have the right knowledge about process, operation, DCS, instrumentation, etc. etc. And that's what we bring to the table. So that's, uh, that's how we add value. All right, so wrapping up, I, I guess uh, our observations on why companies have difficulties in delivering on the alarm management project to the full is, is simply that there often is nobody in the organization who combines the experience in the, in the different disciplines that, that are required to drive the project and, and ensure that the meetings with the, the different disciplines are made as efficiently as possible. Uh, because these, these meetings, as I said, are very expensive meetings. Um, Another observation is that if you, if you have that person in your organization, um, he or she is, is typically 150% busy already, so there's no time to spend on, on the alarm management project, and, and in particular to do the, the root cause analysis and, and come up with detailed, proposed, uh, uh, detailed proposals for, for alarm solutions for individual alarms that make sense also from from the DCS implementation point of view and, and get the buy-in from, from operations side. Um, now, we've seen uh, that in cases where customers outsource that, that pivotal role, uh, they ensure that the time that their own staff have to spend on the, um, on the alarm management project is, is spent as efficiently as possible, um, primarily by reviewing and agreeing on the proposed solutions rather than developing the solutions themselves. And, and this outsourcing can be done on an as-needed basis for specific phases in the project. Uh, but our experience is that if the, the external consultant is involved in the early phases of the project, including the benchmarking study and, and the development of an alarm philosophy, then the, the execution phase of the project tends to be even more efficient. And last but not least, every company that we've seen that has been able to deliver on the full alarm management value um, has been actively reporting the alarm system KPIs on a regular basis across the organization. They, they, they keep benchmarking themselves to make sure that they stay on top of things and, and don't let alarm creep happen. Um, all right, so I'd like to close off by, by stressing the importance of, of process knowledge and, and operations experience one more time. Alarm management is not data driven. Um, data only helps you to decide where to focus, but it's the detailed understanding of the process and its operation that will truly create the value um, from your alarm management activities. Um, and with that, I'd like to open the floor for questions. Um, and again, please make sure to post your questions through the, the WebEx Q&A chat window. Um, and I've already seen some uh, questions coming in uh, during the presentation, so let me dive right into it. Um, all right, let me take this one first here. First question is, do I need software to do the, the benchmarking study? Um, I guess you mean, do I need to have alarm management software installed for us to do the, the benchmarking study? Um, that's, that's not strictly needed. If you can provide us with your alarm and events database, um, then that's, that's good. Quite often, alarm and event information is, uh, is stored as, as text files, for instance. Uh, sometimes it's in a SQL database or, or something similar. And if you can give us that alarm and event information, that alarm and event history as a text file, um, then that's good for us to do the study. Uh, we can import that in the tools we use and, and we do our analysis uh, based on that. So it means we can do the entire benchmarking activity without you having to have alarm management software in place. Um, and also if you, if you don't have alarm and event history stored somewhere, uh, we can help you by temporarily installing some simple collection software that will collect the alarm and event data. But obviously it will take a while before we can then start to do the benchmarking study yeah, because we, we need to have some, uh, some history data first. Um, next question, do we, do we have to develop an alarm philosophy document to get started on alarm management? Um, 
Mm, in order to get started on the bad actor resolution, etc., you do, I don't think you strictly need an alarm philosophy document, but we do recommend that you at least put together a very, very rudimentary philosophy document, uh, it, a very basic format, because um, it gets everyone in the organization aligned on the on the different aspects that that play into alarm management. Uh, you want to, I guess, you want to make sure that the the process engineers, the process operations department, the, the DCS team, the instrumentation team, they, they all have the same expectations on, on alarm management and, and on the way you're going to deal with uh, changing alarm settings uh, and, and configuration of alarms, etc. So that alignment, I think, is, is best achieved by working on some form of an alarm philosophy document. Um, and, and of course, another reason to develop an alarm philosophy document is, is to set yourself some targets, um, and the key metrics and, and targets. Remember, you, you want to keep measuring yourself against some agreed metrics and, and to make sure that you don't have the number of alarms creeping up again. And, and this, this target setting is typically part of your alarm philosophy uh, discussions. So uh, to get back to the original question, no, you don't strictly need it, but yes, it does really help the project. And if you're really keen on getting started with the bad actor resolution, of course, you can go ahead and, and do it, and then in parallel, maybe develop your alarm philosophy uh, document. Um, there's a question here that got asked by two different people. Um, do you work on alarms per unit or across the site? And I guess the second, yeah, that comes down to the same. Um, do you work on alarms per unit or across the site? That, that's a good question too, because there's there's different ways to, to look at this. Uh, for, for the benchmarking study, we would always try to look at the entire site. Um, we would want to take the different alarm and event history files for all the units across the site and, and do the benchmarking study based on that site-wide data. Because um, that, that will show you where and, and on what unit or in what area of the site most alarms are, are being generated. And then, it, of course, it's tempting to to start focusing on that area yeah, where, where most of the alarms are being generated, but you really need to ask yourself the question whether that's the best use of, of your time to, to start on that area. Because remember that one of the biggest values of alarm management is to keep the plant running in, in upset conditions. So you could also ask yourself the question what, what unit will cost you the highest amount of money if it is shut down unexpectedly. And even if that unit does not show in the top three uh, of, of units with the most alarms, then still you could ask yourself the question whether that should not be the first unit to work on. Eh? Let, let me give you a purely hypothetical example. Suppose, um, suppose the benchmarking study shows you that the, uh, the sour water stripper is the unit where most alarms are being generated, and, and your crude unit is showing as, as number four on the list with the highest number of alarms. Then still it might be worthwhile to first focus on the crude unit area because if you have an unplanned shutdown of, of the crude unit, then that's probably going to have more impact on your overall operation. Um, so to get back to the question, it, we recommend um, that the decision on, on where to focus first is based on a combination of where the highest number of alarms uh, are occurring and uh, which unit has the highest impact on, on your operation if it shuts down unexpectedly. Um, and, and when I say impact, uh, the impact of a, of a unit shut down, I, d I don't only mean money, uh, but also um, maybe even more importantly, uh, safety, equipment integrity, those type of things. Um, here's a, a next question in particular on software. Um, can you advise what software we should use for alarm management. Um, <laughs> I want to stress that we're technology independent. We don't have our own alarm management software. Uh, we're not linked to any of the alarm management software providers. Um, we, can, we can share our experience on different alarm management software packages available, uh, but we will always look at the specific situation at the customer site. Uh, we, we look at um, 
I, I guess the, the thing we look at is what do you want to achieve? Uh, what What's the point on the horizon with respect to alarm management? Uh, for instance, um, do you just want to do the, the um, the first few phases of an alarm management project to, to address the, the top many alarms? Um, or do you want to ultimately move towards, for instance, predictive alarming? Uh, something that we haven't touched on in, in this webinar. Um, or do you, do you, are you looking to implement pop-up alarm narratives for the operators, etc.? So all those type of things, uh, uh, also reporting, that, that's an important aspect that, that plays a role in the choice for alarm management uh, software. Uh, do you want your users in the business long to be able to access reports on alarms? Um, what does your IT infrastructure look like? Uh, how does this software fit into your architecture with the control network, the DMZ, the business LUM? It's all these aspects that we take into account when we are asked uh, what type of software packages would, would be best suited for, for a customer. But again, uh, we're, we're completely technology independent uh, here. Um, Another question that has come in, have you ever implemented this on uh, batch processes? Um, the answer is, yeah, why not? I mean, the, the, it's all about the, the, the process knowledge and um, the, um, yeah, combining the, the experience of the, of the different uh, DCSs or PLCs, uh, if you want, um, the, the knowledge on instrumentation and the, and the process operations knowledge. Uh, we have some batch experience. I would, uh, I would definitely say most of our experience is in the continuous domain. Um, but there's no reason why exactly the same type of workflow would be um, applicable to, uh, to a batch process. Um, I guess one of the things that we would have to look at in, in the benchmarking study, for instance, is the different uh, uh, recipes that might apply for your, uh, for your batch process because the alarms that, uh, the alarm settings, for instance, that uh, uh, should be um, put in might depend on the recipes that you're running for, for, uh, for different batches. Um, and the same might hold actually for continuous processes as well. There, there's uh, quite a few processes out there that can run in distinct different operational modes. Um, and of course that plays into your alarm management as well. Um, you don't want alarms to go off simply because of the fact that you're moving from operational window A to operational window B. Uh, and again, that that is the, the key process operations knowledge that I refer to a couple of times. Uh, that, that's why data doesn't do it for your alarm management. Um, you need the process knowledge to, uh, to be able to uh, be successful in your, um, in your alarm management project. All right, we're coming up to the, uh, to the hour mark. Um, there's a, a few questions still outstanding. Um, I am recording those questions here. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to go uh, uh, and close this, uh, this webinar. Um, but rest assured that I will get back to each and one of you who has a question outstanding here um, to, uh, to give you an answer on that question. Um, so uh, that's, that's the end of the webinar uh, today. If you would like to receive a copy of today's presentation, then uh, please email me at the indicated me email address. Um, you can watch a recording of this webinar and, and previous webinars of IPCOS on our YouTube channel. Uh, just go to YouTube and search for IPCOS to, to get to our channel. Um, it will take uh, probably one to two days before this webinar gets posted. Um, so please bear with us. Um, also, if you want to discuss the possibility of, of for instance, doing a quick benchmarking study of, of your alarm situation, please do contact me. Um, and with that, I'm just going to introduce our next webinar briefly. Um, that'll be in, in March. And our next uh, webinar will cover nonlinear PID controls. Um, and I'll read out the abstract here. Uh, uh, the, the PID controllers are the most commonly used um, controllers in the DCS and, and PLC uh, space. But PID controllers are, are linear controllers and, and type control is not straightforward when process behavior is, is very nonlinear. Um, and in the next webinar, uh, we will show some, some tips and tricks on how to improve the performance of PID loops that are used to uh, control nonlinear processes. So 
we look forward to welcoming you at our next webinar. And for now, thanks for your participation. It was good to see so many people participate in this webinar. And uh, you all have a great day.